The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. On today's show, we're gonna learn about aquaponics and we're gonna turn a little plant like this into a full-size plant on some of these vertical walls using water and fish. We also get to meet Stan Tequila. He's an author, he's a naturalist, and he's gonna show us some of his beautiful work and tell us how we can attract birds to our own backyard garden. And we'll get a great recipe from Chef Larson as usual. I hope you'll stay with us. Garden Connections is coming up next. It's not often that you find 100 acres worth of produce in the middle of a major metropolitan area. But that's exactly what's going on at Garden Fresh Farms in the heart of the Twin Cities. They're using an innovative process called aquaponics, and it involves the combination of plants and fish, recirculation of water. It's really an amazing system. And we're joined today by Dave Rosen, who is the founder of this very fascinating farm. Dave, thanks so much for inviting us to be here. I can't wait to hear more about this. Well, thanks for coming. Actually, it was snowing earlier today, so you have all this lush green and you can kind of hear the rainforest in the background. It, it too. tropical. So, yeah, <laughs> it's very does. tropical. So plants and fish, what came first? What, what brought you to this idea of aquaponics? Well, um, I was trying to solve a problem for myself, and that is that I, I owned a warehouse building similar to this one that was empty. And I thought, how am I going to fill it in a down economy? And I thought, I've started other businesses and grown them and sold them. I would just start another business to do that. And I got bitten by the aquaponic bug. I was looking for a, a business that would be fresh and green and natural and local and all of those things. And I thought, it, it, I would you know like to own a business like that and so I did my research and I kept on coming back to aquaponics. Coming back to it. Now this is a fascinating, I, I love this is kind of a closed system but yep. but it's a hybrid almost of people are familiar with hydroponics. Mm -hmm. We've done some programs on growing plants in water with nutrients in the water and then of course there's aquaculture where people raise fish for eating on the table. In this system, you're getting both on your plate. Tell, right. tell us right. how that works, just in big picture sense. Well, it, we really are getting uh, the benefits of that. See, if you're in aquaculture, if you've ever had goldfish or something at home, you always have to take off about 10% of the water and throw it away because it, it gets toxic for the fish. Well, what we do is we're, our water is recirculating all the time, and so we're taking what the fish waste they're making. They're making a lot of ammonia. And we run that through bacteria, the healthy bacteria that converts it into nitrogen. And we send that to the plants. And the plants, of course, like nitrogen. And uh, they like some of the other things that are in the water, including some of the CO2 that the fish exhale, and that's in the water. And so then the plants then, in this partnership, they, uh, they clean out the water. And then we send it right back to the fish. So we capture all the water, and that's, we can use a lot less water in that. But it, it can be very simple. It could be a bucket system at home or a large, larger commercial operation like we have. I like to say that the original environmentalists were accountants. <laughs> and uh, because if you talk to your accountant, your accountant says, uh, you know, can we reduce the waste? Can we reuse that? Can, how do we cut back the scrap and the labor and all that? And that's really how we've uh, taken a look at this. How can we never have a garbage can outside? How can we recycle everything in here? Uh, because it works outside of this building in the world. Why doesn't, why can't we make it work in this and building? And you're condensing it. I love that sustainability concept. I, I know we've, we've talked about in gardens, a lot of people plant and they put a fish in the bottom of the hole. You know, that's a very old timey trick yep. uh, to getting things to grow. You're actually just keeping it moving, always keeping things recycling in your system. Right, and we do have some byproducts. Uh, we do have some compost and we do have some fish solid waste, but um, people are lining up basically to, to, to get that from us. Now in an enclosed environment, you are typically able to control things like pests. You know, gardeners who garden outside really don't have much control of that, but you're able to eliminate 
bugs, predators, those kinds of things that might otherwise affect your plants, is that right? Because we're in a warehouse, it's a, it's a brick building, uh, we can control the access and we do keep the bugs off, so we do not have to have any pesticides. And that's something that people are very concerned about very in, in their homes today. Yep. yep, that's great. Well, in a minute, you're gonna show me some of the actual components of this, the specific plants that you grow, and we're gonna take a peek at those fish as well. But right now, we're gonna visit with Stan Tequila. He is a naturalist, a photographer, he loves birds, and birds are one of those wonderful natural pest controls outside. So let's find out what Stan tells us about how to attract birds to your backyard garden. We're here at the Harmel Nature Center, and I am so pleased to have as our special guest, Stan Tequila. Stan is a well-known author, photographer, naturalist. He's just an exceptional person when it comes to wildlife. Thank you so much for being part of the program. Well, thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. You have written numerous books, and many of you will be familiar with books like this, Birds of Minnesota and other states. You've done a mm -hmm. ton of those, mammals, wildflowers, a very well-rounded guy. And he's got <laughs> a new one out about loons, our beautiful state bird. So we're here in southern Minnesota. You've been everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell us about the types of birds that many people are looking to see in our part of the world. Well, I like when people always talk about things like landscaping for wildlife. I always joke and poke fun at them to say, you're not actually landscaping for wildlife. You're landscaping for a handful of birds that come to your yard that you want to see. Mm -hmm. So there are things like cardinals and blue jays and robins and hummingbirds are the birds that most people really want to see in their yards. There's a lot of color with them. Yes. Yeah. A lot of times song. Yeah. You know, one of the things um, to think about is that when we try to attract birds to our garden, we shouldn't be thinking, we're going to do it to benefit the birds. It should be more along the lines of we're going to do it to benefit ourselves so that we may see and enjoy those birds because mm -hmm. they don't need us. Okay. But it seems like people need them. And so if you keep that in mind when you put out your bird feeders, you put them in areas in which you can see these birds and enjoy them. Anyway. And that's, it brings them closer to you. And that's what the whole idea behind bird feeding is. That's great. Are there things that people can do? And, and I know there are many viewers who live in town. There are others that live in the country. And the types of birds that you track sometimes can be different depending on the surrounding habitat. Give us a sense of, so you've got a house in town. Mm -hmm. What kind of birds can you expect to attract? If you're doing feeders, are bird baths important? Right. So kind of the answer to that is yes and no. Mainly, a lot of the birds are going to be the same, town or out in the country, with a few exceptions. Because what you're doing is you're enticing these birds with seeds and uh, the food. And birds that are feeding on, let's just say, uh, insects, doesn't matter. They're, mm -hmm. they're going to be coming and going on their own anyhow. Okay. So it's a certain uh, group of about 25 birds that you can attract with different types of seeds or fruit or like a nectar for hummingbirds. Okay. And so there's things like that you can, uh, you, you want to consider when you're trying to attract birds to your yard. You want to think about, uh, you know, what types of, uh, how much room do you have and what types of birds do you want to get in there too. Mm -hmm. So, and if you have a fairly small backyard, are you are you limited primarily to songbirds? Um, well, most people don't want to feed big raptors anyhow, or crows and <laughs> things like that. True. Again, that's why I'm saying when we go back to that whole thing about landscaping for wildlife. Well, no, not it's really a misnomer. You want to landscape for just a few handful of birds that you really seem to like. Mm -hmm. Most people seem to like, mm -hmm. and that is. So um, a small backyard is just as easy to attract birds to. I, for example, I was in a very, very small backyard in uh, southern Florida and southwestern Florida, and the amount of birds jammed in that one little tiny backyard was amazing, as opposed to, because there was enough habitat there, as opposed to being out in the open, you may have a big mm -hmm. open area, mm -hmm. if there's not enough trees for cover mm -hmm. to, to hide from uh, predators and things mm -hmm. like that, you're not going to get any birds at all. So size okay. really doesn't matter, it's the habitat it's, that you're okay. talking about. All right, yeah. you have a beautiful yard. You yeah. showed me a picture of your yard and it's fantastic. Yeah. Tell me what some of your favorite plants are. So my, my whole gardening, um, uh, I don't know what my theory would be, is um, try to do as little gardening as possible and with the most amount of bang, the most okay. amount of uh, things. So I, I plant all perennials. I'm not big on the natives because they're not as showy. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if we lived in the uh, you know, southern states, we'd probably have a lot more varieties we could choose from. But living here in Minnesota, it's a little tough for us to get a wide variety of large blooming flowers all, all you know, blooming season. Right. So I go a lot with the, uh, the, the regular perennials. 
that uh, everybody else would be. I have a particular uh, kind of liking for the daylilies because okay. there's so many different varieties, and they, mm. as you know, they bloom quite long. Right. And uh, so I, I like that, um, and, and they're, they don't get out of control. I don't like when they go everywhere. <laughs> right, so my whole, basic. yeah, my okay. whole theory on uh, on gardening is, um, I have what I call a survival garden. I plant a bunch of things, mm -hmm. whatever survives. I go out and get more of that. <laughs> Gets more of that. That makes sense, though, because yeah, that's obviously working that's what's for your work. space. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, okay. and then I plant them very tightly together, which I know breaks a lot of the rules too. And then um, I put down uh, a bark mulch on top of it because I don't like to weed mm -hmm. at all. In fact, I try well, not you're to busy do any Yeah. <laughs> So then I let it just go at it, and, okay. that, and it's like I say, it's my survival garden. We last season we visited a blueberry mm -hmm. uh, garden, mm -hmm. and they were actually working to remove or to prevent birds from coming in and stealing mm -hmm. their blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any thoughts on how we can, in a friendly way, uh, make sure that perhaps some of the more destructive behavior of birds doesn't yeah. impact our garden? So it's interesting that we would call it destructive behavior, and the birds perspective would call it surviving, <laughs> you know, just eating, right. you know. And so um, uh, for me, I always try to like plant extras just for the birds. I know okay. when you're talking about commercial businesses and things like that, it's a real challenge, mm -hmm. especially when you're trying to grow things like uh, sunflower seeds or bluebirds, mm -hmm. blueberries or things like that. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so you've seen quite a number of birds. I mean, it is your occupation to mm -hmm. go out yeah. and take pictures of them. Yeah. Tell us about your most... <gasps> Mm -hmm. Wow, moment. Oh so, my gosh, I can't uh, believe I saw. Yeah. What? So coming up on 30 years of doing this, and uh, I've had a, quite a few of those experiences where um, I've had birds that I didn't think I'd ever see. Mm -hmm. uh, one time I was in um, uh, uh, out of Nome, Alaska, which is a thousand miles north of Anchorage, way up in the northern part of Alaska, and I climbed a mountain, had to drive 40 miles down a, a rutted uh, road, cross two streams, parked the truck, climbed a, a mountainside, which took me half a day, mm -hmm. to get to the top to find the one and only spot in all of North America where a bristle thigh curlew nests. And I was wow. able to find this bird up there. Uh -huh. It's about this big, okay. big long bill on it, and it's bristly little thighs called mm -hmm. the bristle Hence thigh curlew. The yep. And there it was. And so I, got, I have okay. lots of those, uh, there's so many of those types of experiences where there you are in the absolute wilderness, mm -hmm. so far away, mm -hmm. hauling you know lots of camera gear, <laughs> You know, Big, heavy camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mosquito bitten, you know, hungry and, mm -hmm. and tired and sweaty. Right. And, and then, but there it is. And that's what it's all, it all comes right. down to that. Right. Stan, it is obvious that you love nature. Oh, and, my and gosh. And I yeah. thank you so much for coming in and sharing your information, your helpful hints, and your beautiful pictures about all these birds. Well, thanks. I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to dedicate my life to educating people about wildlife and how to enjoy them and bring them closer and to and try to accept them as they are. And so That's awesome. Well, you're doing a great fantastic. job and it, you can tell that you're passionate about it. No, thanks. Well, stay with us. More Garden Connections is coming up next. Well, Stan is a great photographer. He had some wonderful shots of, of birds and other animals, but we are back here at Garden Fresh Farms with Dave Roser and we are checking out how this whole system works. And so we're in front of these amazing vertical walls. That kind of threw me. Anytime I'd seen anything about aquaponics, I'd always seen horizontal walls, but mm -hmm. you've got vertical walls. Tell us why you chose to go this way and, and do the plants seem to care? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is how we, we get the space and the density and the power. And what we've done is we've taken floating raft systems that you may have seen in a greenhouse, and we've turned them up like this and sandwiched them together. Okay. So instead of floating, what we're doing is these are on an overhead conveyor system and the roots are inside and they get watered mm -hmm. uh, through here. And as you heard the water running before... I can it hear was, it raining, as yeah, it were, in other parts of the here. building. It, it's raining. The water from the fish is coming through here and the plants are then taking the nutrients out of the water okay. and, and taking some of the CO2, putting oxygen back into the water mm -hmm. and then we collect it down here All the way down and it goes right back to the fish. So mm -hmm. there is, it, we... So it's kind of like you're cleaning. You're filtering the water. Yeah, as that's it right. We're through. filtering. Yes. Great. And the plants seem to love it. Tell us what this is. This is just gorgeous. Yeah, these are, um, you know, this is just leaf, leaf uh, lettuce here. It's, uh, it's quite tasty. You can, matter of fact, if you notice, uh, I mean, it's, it's green and it's luscious and uh, you, can, uh, you can eat it if you like. Look at that. Beautiful it's, and it's garden great fresh. color, too. <laughs> because it just came out of the garden and it's a spring-like lettuce. Uh, it's safe to eat mm -hmm. because what we're doing is we keep the water off of the plants mm -hmm. and also fish um, are different than we are because they, they're cold blooded and so some of the pathogens that they have don't transfer don't to transfer us and so the uh, it's, it's always good to wash produce but there's no pesticides. Right, there's nothing's no other been things. sprayed on these. This is just how healthy they get. 
with that right. water running right. running through this inside because there's no dirt here other than you can see there's a little root ball yep. stuck here in the wall. What, what's happening here is that that. we're restressing the plant a little bit, but not enough to hurt it, mm -hmm. but enough to, to make the physical nature change a little bit. It brings out the mm -hmm. oils, the aroma, mm -hmm. and as you can see, the, the stem isn't woody because it doesn't need to weather some of the it's things that it does. Itself. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And in the you know these uh, plants don't care about gravity as much, and we will show you some others that do they care do. about gravity okay. and how that works for them. So. Okay, and. These would, like, this lettuce to me looks nearly ready to harvest. Yeah. How long is it going to be in this system? Like, you start your own seeds, right? Right. We start and then you the transplant seeds. them to these boards. So how long do they stay in a board like this? Well, what we do is we start them and we put them in trays and they're in our kindergartens. So little plants growing up with little fish. And then okay. what we do is after two weeks, they get transplanted into uh, to the boards. And so what happens is the boards are harvested first to make room for them, and they, it's sanitized, then we plant the little seedlings in, and they okay. actually behind you is a, a row that is of uh, the seedlings just been, have been planted. And what okay, they're going so to do is new. they're going to travel down the warehouse and turn around and come back okay. here, and it'll take about five weeks for that to happen. Okay, all right. So the cycle is not all that different than growing them outside. It's just you have a little bit better control on your environment right. and the water that's circulating through. Great. Right, they control the, and instead of one layer, we've got multiple layers going right. here, and in Minnesota. That's how you get your 100 acres in such a that's small right. that's space. That's right, that's right, 100 acres, 100 to 1 uh, is the ratio, and, and you know, if you had that, I mean, in Minnesota, you better not plant crops until, what, mid-May, late May these that's days? That's right. Uh, because you could always get a late frost, and, right. and we're growing on the, on the toughest day of the year, we're still growing. That's right. Let's talk about the fish side of this. The place that these plants get their nutrients. What kind of fish do you use and what kind of containers? Describe that half of the system. Well, in this facility, we're growing them in smaller containers here, uh, uh, but we're growing tilapia. And the, okay. the reason we picked the tilapia is mul multiple reasons. One is that they're, they're pretty tough fish. So somebody is <laughs> so very hardy. Yeah. It, it, very hardy. A beginner, it would be tough to, you know, to, to, to kill them. I always say that. If one was living in a pothole, as long as it wasn't a big truck that went over the pothole, it would still be okay. <laughs> but they, um, they're, they're tough fish, um, but they, they like it warm. And so there's a good match with the plants. You want the plants like the water to be somewhere 70 degrees, something okay. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, other cold water fish like at 40 degrees, so that's oh, not a good match. So that would shock your plants then right. if you started running cold water through them. Right, that would be a problem. The, um, the tilapia, on the other hand, they like it very warm. They would prefer it to be 85, mm -hmm. but 70 is just fine for them. Tell us about the plants that you can grow. We've got green things here that typically are lettuces that you see a lot right. in hydroponic systems, herbs, things like that. Can you grow a cucumber? Can you grow a tomato? Well, yeah, that's very interesting. Obviously, here it'd be pretty hard to grow a watermelon in here, so <laughs> uh, we haven't done that. But we, what we are doing is leafy greens. We're okay. doing uh, 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 oregano, thyme, uh, watercress. Uh, we are growing uh, microgreens, we're growing basil, we're growing a lot of different products. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, back in our Maplewood facility, we're doing a lot of testing. Right now we're doing a testing uh, with the USDA on some non-edible crops as well. Oh, Things okay. that can be processed into ingredients for health and beauty and possibly okay. uh, pharmaceuticals. So. so lots of avenues there. Now you mentioned some plants thrive, do just fine on these vertical kind of sit-ups where they don't mind where gravity Right. orients them, but you've got another setup that goes around. That's and, correct. And I understand that is because those plants tend to prefer an up versus down. That's right. You, you know, often if you've ever knocked a plant over, or your cat has or something, mm -hmm. you'll see the plant will try to grow up like this. Mm -hmm. and, it, and in a very short period of time, it will start to do that. And, and because of the way we do things, actually in here, the, the root structure of this plant is very, very small compared mm -hmm. to what you would expect in a hydroponic plant operation or even in your outside Right, we've board. seen that. They've got quite a root growth and, and these are pretty tiny. Very tiny. They yeah. actually just don't need all of that because mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're watering it on a regular <laughs> basis and it doesn't need to stretch out and look, where's that water coming yep, from? Where are those nutrients? We're giving it that water? Which means, again, less waste, less yep. things to compost. Very efficient. Love right. that. That's the whole right. idea. Well, you have some really beautiful lettuce here great greens. They look fantastic. We have our favorite chef, Chef Steven Larson, and he is from Quarter Quarter Restaurant, and he's got a wonderful recipe for us today, which includes beautiful greens. It's arugula this time with crab, apples, and walnuts. I think you'll really like it. Take a look.
spring has sprung and it's time to start thinking about those first greens coming up in the garden. The recipe I'm going to do next is for arugula. So I have 10 ounces of arugula here in the bowl. That's going to be enough for about four entree size portions. I like to mix that with things that are a little bit sweet and a little bit nutty. So we're going to add some apple to that, some nice fresh crab, some toasted walnuts, and then we're going to finish it off with a bit of white wine vinegar and walnut oil. So very quick, very simple. First thing we need to do though is cut some apple and I'm just going to cut slices around the core here. And then we'll take that and cut that into what's called a julienne or a matchstick size. We say matchstick, but not actually matchstick sized. You can spend as much or as little time doing this as you want. Just get it cut down into some nice small pieces. I'm going to take a whole medium apple for that. Okay, and then we can add our other ingredients. Uh, I have a cup of uh, lump snow crab meat here. I'm going to toss that in the bowl. A cup of toasted walnut pieces. I like toasting walnuts first, actually any nuts, because it really brings out that nuttiness of the nut. Some salt and pepper for seasoning, and also a bit of sugar just to bring things together. So to finish this up, just a quick drizzle of white wine vinegar. We need about three tablespoons on there. And a goodly shot of a nice nutty oil. I'm using walnut oil for this. Because it's four entree size portions, I'm using about three quarters of a cup of oil. So we give that a very good stir making sure to get all of those ingredients incorporated around. Okay, then we are going to plate. So we'll get a nice plate. And we will take about a quarter of that mixture, making sure to get plenty of goodies on everybody's salad. And it's ready to serve. So there we have it. Arugula salad, crab, walnuts, and apple. It's springtime on a plate. So Dave, watching that segment about uh, Chef Larson's recipe made me think about, he had crab in his recipe. And these are your tanks that you raise the fish in, but can you in this system work in other types of water-based animals? Like could you raise crab or shrimp or some of those other delicacies that we have to ship in from the coasts here in Minnesota? Well, uh, yes we can. Uh, you know, when we look at here, we actually have three uh, life uh, organisms in this building. We have the plants that we think of besides ourselves. That is. So there's <laughs> the plants and there's the fish and there's the bacteria. And the bacteria play a big role in this as well. But we, we have the, tap, uh, the tilapia, but in the Maplewood operation, we are also been ra raising rainbow trout oh, uh, for the last uh, okay. two years. And so uh -huh. uh, we have a restaurant in town that's been featuring our, our rainbow trout for the uh, uh, this month and next month as well. Uh, and so we can. Um, differences in the fish, uh, trout like very cold water and okay. a lot of oxygen, and the tilapia like it to be warmer and can have less oxygen. Now, obviously, salt water uh, fish would not work for us, but okay. there are freshwater prawns, uh, okay. and, so, and so people do eat that. They, the problem is that when you're in a confined area, when you have aquatic creatures that have weapons, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> they true. have walleye have teeth, and uh -huh. the, the, the trout have teeth too, but they're not quite as lethal as the walleye. Uh, the, the others have, you know, 
glued pincers, yep. yeah, and things, yep. and so they um, they they can be cannibalistic. They oh, can, okay. So you have uh, to watch your density, I suppose, or right, provide some dense. protection for those smaller ones. Yeah. Bass, you know, you have a hundred bass in there, and you keep on feeding them, and then one day you go to harvest, and you only had two big ones, <laughs> you know, and they ate the rest. So, right. um, so there has to be a balance of the, the right water temperature to the plants. Uh, uh, what their output's going to be, what your density's going to be. Right. Uh, because we try to actually limit the amount of fish. We're not a big fish operation because mm -hmm. it's hard to compete with large factory farms or those fish, uh, the, uh, seagoing Open fish. Open harvest, you know, right. Ships and, right. Uh, so tell us about, your system is enormous. For the home gardener, is this something that can be scaled down to perhaps a little koi pond and a few heads of lettuce? Is, does that work for the home gardener? Well, it can, and, and a lot of people ask us about, well, can you, you know, put one of these in my garage? And the answer is no. <laughs> so we, we build and, and uh, put together uh, commercial systems to be able to do that. But for your, your average person that would like to, to do this, um, you know, you could start with a little uh, a garden inside, you, you know, your kitchen window and things like that. But if you, uh, uh, I, I have a colleague in Colorado who's in aquaculture, and he actually has a, a, uh, a bucket uh, with, with cold fish in it, and he's got this enormous uh, uh, tomato plant growing. Okay. And it's just the water cycling through and, yep. and growing the tomato plant as the fish get bigger. So, right. so it can be done. a little hard at home to have those fish kind of turn into pets. Might be hard to have them for dinner. <laughs> uh, so it might be good to have But something. I bet that tomato tastes really good in January. Uh, I'll bet it does. Well, Dave, thank you so much for letting us come to your place. It's been a fascinating visit. Well, thank you for coming today. It was, it was right. a pleasure having you. Love learning about aquaponics. And thank you for joining us here at Garden Connections. I hope to see you again next time.